This is a Vault Studios production. The day before the homicide, Dana uh, was at my house. And uh, kind of made... Uh, kind of made the case personal. On the side of State Route 70 in California, heading northeast from Sacramento, just before you reach the turnoff for Quincy, there's an old wooden building on the side of the road. It looks abandoned. The windows are boarded up, and outside, there's a faded wooden sign with white lettering that reads, Ketty Resort. I'd go down to Ketty for the weekend, stay the night. We'd fish, hike, go on big adventures. Once a welcome site for Californians looking to get away for a while, that sign is now a reminder of the horror that happened there decades ago, and of all the ways life changed afterward. All my kids, family kids, and then kids around the block would go and sleep out in the front yard in sleeping bags. You know, there'd be 10 or 12 kids after the homicide. They were afraid to do that. It was it was a little kind of a little haunting for me when the yeah. when the when the murders occurred. I was 15 and I had stayed the night in that cabin on a number of occasions. Uh, in the, in the 78, 79, 80. April 11th, 1981. A 14-year-old girl walked up to one of the cabins at the Ketty Resort, cabin 28. She opened the door to reveal a crime scene that still rattles investigators to this day. And then at 15, when something like that happens, um, and having known, you know, knowing the boys uh, and the little, you know, little Tina was in my mother's class. Yeah, it, it got real personal real fast. And that leaves an indelible mark on, on, on this community and, and a lot of people. Digging into this case as a reporter 40 years later took me from my news station in Sacramento all the way up to Ketty, past that old resort sign and deep into the county's local news archives, where I eventually came across the headline, Triple Slang in Ketty, in an old newspaper called the Feather River Bulletin. The article underneath began, a quiet pall of horror blanketed Ketty Sunday morning after three people were found bludgeoned and cut to death in a slang that the sheriff has characterized as the worst crime in Plumas County in years. It's a crime investigators are still trying to piece together today, a weight they still carry, and are reminded of every time they drive past that faded wooden sign on the side of the highway. But when I sat down with detectives while covering this case last year, they told me they're closer than ever to solving it. I I, I believe that some way, shape, or form, we're gonna be able to pull this together. My name is Shay McAllister. And I'm Madison Wade. We're both journalists, and for years we've been covering unsolved cases on TV, talking to investigators and families of victims, all pushing for answers. Cases we haven't forgotten and still want to see solved. This is Beyond Bardstown, Unsolved. Madison, today we're going to be taking a closer look at a case that forever changed the small community of Ketty, California. You actually visited Ketty while covering the story. Tell me a little bit about that trip up to Plumas County. Yeah, Shay, it's very important to go where the crimes took place. It brings you there. We also visited around the same time of the year when the murders happened. It was a beautiful drive, but a long drive that took several different highways. And then we appeared in a very rural area, surrounded by dense forest. Ketty stands out, not only because of what happened there, but it physically stands out from the highway. On the side of State Route 70, on the way to Quincy, California, a rickety wooden building with boarded up window stands and it's labeled Ketty Resort. Now driving into Ketty Resort, 
is a little risky, but we did it because I, I wanted to see what it looked like um, because of what happened. We just needed to get video. We needed to look at it. We needed to just sit there for a moment. But we didn't get out of the car because it's private property. The resort still stands and several cabins are there, but cabin 28 is no longer there. It was condemned and demolished after what happened. So Madison, when I think about a resort, I think about somewhere that people go for vacation and just for like a short period of time. At Ketty Resort, were people actually living there? Was that their main home? Yeah, so at the time, it was really a place people came to vacation. But we do know several families also occupied and and stayed there for an extended period of time. These cabins were set up like full-on homes. They had a kitchen, they had several bedrooms, and um, there were several dozens of cabins. So interesting, a resort. I have a picture in my head, but what did the Ketty Resort really look like back then? Who lived there? So Ketty Resort was a booming place since it was founded in the early 1900s. People used to get on the train and travel to Ketty for a week or a weekend to relax, enjoy the outdoors and camp. You could rent a cabin and eventually you could live there too. The cabins were close together. It was like a tight-knit community. Everyone knew everyone. There was a large pond by the entrance too. And just kids were able to explore. They played outside. A lot of people fished in the nearby rivers for trout. And then the Ketty Lodge restaurant was packed almost every single night with customers who came from as far as San Francisco. You know, Ketty will never come back to what it was. It was the place to go. It was a fun place. Uh, The barn, restaurant, some of the best food in Plumas County. And then one night, horror happened. Take us through what exactly happened that night. Well, the Sharp family, they were staying inside cabin 28. Glenna Sharp, the mother, she was a single mom. She had several kids. John Sharp, her oldest, was 15. Tina was 12. Sheila was 14. Her two sons, Ricky and Greg, were nine and five. Now, there were two other boys not related to the family, but their friends were also there. Justin Smart, who was 12, he lived in cabin 26. And then Dana Wingate, he was 17 years old. He was friends with John. Imagine it's just a big group of people hanging out at the Ketty Resort and it was on a weekend. And so a big sleepover happened. We know John Sharp and his friend Dana Wingate got a ride home the night of April 11th. Sheila, the second oldest child, spent the night next door with a friend for a sleepover. She came home to change clothes for church in the morning when she discovered three bodies inside her cabin, cabin 28, covered in blood. They were completely unrecognizable, but Sheila knows who was living there. It was her family. The sheriff's department received a call into Ketty of a possible homicide. Uh, Deputies were dispatched. They went down and found the scene. Uh, The young girl, Sheila, daughter of the in the family, uh, found her mother. Uh, well, actually, she didn't know who they were. Uh, there were uh, three people, uh, bludgeoned uh, and bloody, unfortunately, uh, uh, on the floor in her cabin where she lived. Glenna Sharp, John Sharp, Dana Wingate were all brutally killed. Their throats were slashed. They were bound at their feet and hands. Detectives say their bodies were staged and moved. Murder weapons were left behind, but detectives would later learn one murder weapon was missing and blood was found all over the cabin. They had fingerprint. They, they got a smudge of a fingerprint in blood on the door to the bedroom, uh, and, but it was you know, not identifiable. There was no other blood evidence. In other words, uh, the the victim's uh, blood, because it was so horrific, uh, was the only blood. Important to note, Tina Sharp was missing. They didn't know where she went or what happened and believed at that time that she was kidnapped. And this is maybe the most important piece of this story and something that perplexed detectives to this day. Three children were found locked in a back bedroom unharmed. So we have an incredibly graphic crime scene in one area. There's a child missing, and then 
the killers actually left children behind, safe, unharmed? Yeah, the the youngest children were in the back room as well as the smart child. It's possible the killers intentionally left them there or that they were already in the back bedroom asleep when those murders happened. Justin Smart was able to help detectives with a sketch that was released to the public, but he wasn't able to share more than that. So those sketches is really all detectives had at the time to go off of. Madison, this case is so horrific, and obviously it's sensitive. I mean, we're talking about the brutal murder of children. But what can you tell us about the crime scene and any possible evidence left behind? I can definitely tell you that in Plumas County history, it is the most horrible, horrific crime to have ever happened. It shocked the whole community, not only because of the amount of people killed, but because of where it was and what happened to them. Blood was everywhere. It was on the walls, it was on the ceiling, on the carpet. The bodies were moved, they were staged. Glenna Sharp was naked from the waist down. They were all bound by their hands, their feet, bludgeoned to death. It was just a horrible scene, uh, to say the least. I I did see some crime scene photos and um, it seared into my mind of, of what what happened in that cabin. And another interesting, very notable part of this is how close the cabins were to each other. I'm not talking yards away, um, feet away, if, if anything. And Sheila Sharp, the daughter who came home to find her, her family murdered, she was spending the night next to cabin 28 and nobody heard anything. And Madison Tina, the 12-year-old daughter, is missing So what happens next in the search for her? Where does the investigation go from here? I interviewed Detective Mike Gamberg and former Plumas County Sheriff Greg Hagwood. Uh, They told me Tina and what happened to her is central to this case. So she was initially reported as kidnapped. But why was she taken away from the cabin? It's my strong sense that there was something about Tina, either something that she knew, experienced, or perhaps... Witnessed right there. Witnessed that that did not allow for her to be uh, left there. So, Shay, it's possible Tina was raped, she was pregnant, or she knew something she was not supposed to know. Okay, so nearly an entire family is murdered. One girl is kidnapped. 41 years later, it's still unsolved. Madison, what do you think are some of the main reasons for that? Well, detectives told me it is a solvable case. Detective Mike Gamberg and the former sheriff, Greg Hagwood, say crucial mistakes were made 40 years ago by investigators and the DOJ. I found too many things uh, to be amiss. Evidence wasn't logged, the crime scene was tampered with, and then follow-ups never happened. The whole case was so fragmented. It was like the investigation started out like a shotgun going off. And each one of those pellets was a lead, and nobody followed them up. A great example of this is in the evidence locker. So they still have the carpet and items from the home, but things kept in a freezer were contaminated after the freezer was accidentally left off. DNA wasn't cataloged like it is nowadays, And then the two main suspects in this case were initially interviewed but let go. Those suspects are no longer alive. That alone makes this a very difficult case to solve. And then three major pieces of evidence were found and investigated later. It begs the question, what would have happened if this evidence was investigated initially? And detectives are still not giving up. We're closer now than we were when we started. And the longer we go, the closer we're going to continue to get to to that point where we we can, I think, close the book with a measure of confidence and finality. April 22nd, 1984. It's been three years, almost to the day, since the murders at Ketty Resort. And about 100 miles away from Ketty, a man is out walking the woods of rural Butte County, California. His eyes are fixed on the ground, searching for bottles and cans to recycle. When he spots something, 
It looks like bone. And when he gets closer, he realizes it is bone. It's part of a human skull. Several other bones would be discovered nearby, and the remains would be identified as 12-year-old Tina Sharp. Yeah, she was the, uh, the youngest of uh, the, the Sharp family. Uh, she's 12 years old, and uh, they, her remains were taken from, uh, from Keddie. And uh, that's the remains that they found uh, in uh, Butte County. But why here? Why would whoever did this leave three bodies behind in cabin 28, but bring Tina out to the middle of nowhere, 100 miles away? Detective Mike Gamberg has one theory. Her body was used as a ruse, taking her, taking her away. Uh, I pray to God, and I, and I sincerely believe that she was dead prior to, uh, prior to leaving. Now, 41 years later, both Gamberg and former Plumas County Sheriff Greg Hagwood think Tina is the key to figuring out this entire case. I think Tina was absolutely central to why this happened. And I think there was something about Tina that could not be left there to be discovered um, in death. More than 41 years have gone by since the Getty murders, but a lot has happened in those 41 years, including a handful of major discoveries and even pieces of evidence coming to light. Madison, can you take us through some of those developments? Yeah, so let's start with Tina Sharp. She's the young girl who was taken, kidnapped, three years after the murders of her mom, her brother, and her brother's best friend on April 22nd, 1984, a little more than three years after the murders, someone collecting bottles in the woods in rural Butte County found human remains. Those remains belonged to Tina Sharp. Shortly after the news broke of the discovery, a mysterious phone call came into the Butte County Sheriff's Office. Let's play that recording for you right now. Cool. Oh, yeah. So hearing that, that's very eerie. It's very suspicious. Whoever made this call knew something specific about what happened at Ketty. Because again, people knew that Tina Sharp was missing. Did everyone know her age? Did everyone know about the murder? What about the girl found at Feather Falls? How did this caller know so much and give that away? This call was not investigated initially as it was left in evidence for Detective Mike Gamberg to find. In fact, this call, this recording, was at the very bottom of a box. It's a little difficult to hear what exactly the man is saying in that call, but I'm looking at the transcript, and you're right. He does mention some specific details about the case. He says he's calling about the body found in Butte County near Feather Falls. Oh, yeah. That's you, mm-hmm. And then you were talking about the uh, guy who found at the Feather Falls. Mm-hmm. And you absolutely But then asks if police had thought about the murder in Ketty, where a 12-year-old girl was never found. I was just wondering if... And of course, this call came in before the remains were identified as Tina Sharp. Madison, do you have any idea why this call wasn't initially investigated? How was this not a major red flag for investigators who had had this horrific case on their hands? I asked Detective Gamberg about this, and uh, he told me the same thing. He was perplexed, he was frustrated, he was confused as to why this phone call was never fully vetted or investigated. Uh, It was never listed as evidence. I I couldn't find it, and I had to dig through all the evidence, and I ended up finding it in the paper bag in the bottom box in the evidence line and nobody brought it forward. And since then, they've taken the recording and they're trying their best to match the audio with other 
prior recordings they may have or people who know maybe the voice. When we found that, I sent it off to uh, every agency I could possibly get to to uh, analyze uh, the tape recording. And at that time, uh, I was on a small uh, cassette, cassette yeah. you know. So it was sent off and uh, we were trying to see if we could distinguish the voice and so on. And uh, then I took uh, people who I believe were involved uh, and sent their uh, interviews off uh, to see if maybe we could uh, match them up and so on. And uh, that proved a little fruitless. But at any rate, it was done. It should have been done long before. But it's it's very suspicious, and it really just makes your your hair raise right on your neck when you listen to that voice because it's a man's voice. He sounds very curious, but he also sounds like he knows something, um, almost like he wants to get validation that that Tina Sharp was was the person found, the remains found in the woods. Earlier, you mentioned there was a couple suspects named in this case at some point. Tell us more about that. So spanning this investigation, investigators named two primary suspects, Martin Smart, the neighbors to the Sharps, and his friend, John Bobaday. Martin Smart initially told investigators he was missing a hammer. So get this, in 2016, that's not too long ago, that hammer was found in a pond down the road from where cabin 28 once stood. We uh, were able to find uh... Uh, what I believe to be uh, one of the murder weapons. Uh, it's my belief that uh, uh, after the homicide, or after the whole incident in Kitty, that uh, they were trying to get rid of the evidence. And uh, as they passed by the pond, they tossed it in. I was at that pond. It's, it's not big, it's right off of the main highway. And then you take the road up to the Kitty Resort. Honestly, if someone was trying to get out of there and just ditch the hammer, they probably could have just tossed it from the car. It was not far away from the road at all. And that hammer was found inside the pond. They, they tried their best to, to get any DNA they could off of it, but because it was in the pond for so many years, they couldn't work any DNA off of it. But they do know that that's the hammer, one of the hammers missing from the crime scene and one of the hammers possibly used to kill those three people. So we even took the grip off to see if maybe there was some sweat. You know, I mean, it it was in the pond for 30 years. So it's uh, uh, it's hard to get any evidence off of that. So Smart fled Ketty after the murders. That's another red flag. You know, flight is uh, maybe indicative of a a guilty conscience, you know? And they they literally fled the area. within a day or so of, of, the, of the crimes. Wow. And, uh, and we spoke to the person that drove him out of town. Uh, he's still alive. And again, opportunities that could have been capitalized on many, many years ago, but uh, wow. that were lost. And what may be even more telling is he wrote a letter to his then wife, Marilyn, that said, I've paid the price of your love And now I've bought it with four people's lives. The letter in itself, I believe, confesses to uh, the taking of four people's lives. Detective Gamberg believes a possible motive here is a love triangle. The question is, was Glenna Sharp having an affair with Martin Smart? Martin Smart died in 2006. John Bobaday died in 1988. But are there others involved? Okay, so here we are now in 2022. What is being done to solve this case today? Detective Gamberg and Hagwood say that they are closer now to solving this case than ever before. 40 years now later, with Sheila still alive, um, what would that be like to solidify this, to know exactly who did this and to be able to tell her that and to be able to tell your community what happened up here? I think it would... uh it would it would lift a, an incredible weight um, maybe clear the dark skies that have that have just hung uh, 
over that community, over uh, in the lives of, of people that worked on the case, the surviving family members and relatives, there's, there's, a, there's a weight and a burden that um, sometimes it becomes, uh, you just get used to it, but it's always there. And to, to bring a measure of discernible finality to, to this investigation would, in my estimation, just be uh, an experience of having a, a tremendous weight lifted off of so many people and, and just maybe clear the path for folks to focus more on their future than being anchored in the past. It's really personal for those two detectives I talked to. Gamberg actually was a martial arts teacher and he taught um, those boys back then before he went into the sheriff's office. He knew them when this happened. And then former Sheriff Hagwood, he was 15 at the time. His mom was a grade school teacher and his mom taught those kids. So it's such a rural, tight-knit community up there. Everyone knew everyone back then. And now, 41 years later, it is top priority for these detectives to solve. Yeah, it's interesting to think they'd be in their 50s now. Yeah. You know, those kids. And you think about lives not lived, mm -hmm. um, you know, life experiences never had, children, families, um, things abruptly came to a screaming halt. Uh, and not just for those victims, but for the remainder of the family members. Um, things really came to a, to a screeching halt for everyone. And opportunities and experiences that were denied um, by, uh, you know, such a, such a cruel, heinous act. Um, it's unforgivable. So anyone with information is asked to call the Plumas County Sheriff's Office. Their number is 530-283-6360. We have a $5,000 uh, reward for information leading to, you know, the case. So Madison, you mentioned the two people of interest, the people police believe are responsible are dead. So even if they do find that key piece of evidence, that DNA match, what would solving this case really look like? I did ask them, how do you solve something like this when, when the two primary suspects are no longer alive? Um, and it's something that just continuously haunts this community every single April. Uh, they told me they would most likely have to bring this forward to a grand jury to then have them look at all the evidence in the case and then uh, come through with an indictment down on, on Martin Smart and John Bobaday. Yeah, the only thing you could do with a grand jury is to uh, close the case based on the information that you developed. But they also told me there are more people out there that they believe, you know, have a guilty conscience. I believe there's uh, two individuals that uh, are still alive that uh, were... Probably accessories, accessories after the fact. Yeah. For example, someone who drove Martin Smart out of town um, after this happened, because I, I initially said he skipped town pretty pretty soon after the murders happened, which was a red flag. That person who drove Martin Smart out is still alive to this day. So there are definitely people who are still alive connected to this case. And that's why detectives say they believe they're closer now than ever to solving it, because they're just hoping that because time has passed, someone might be able to come forward with a tip or information um, and help them. You know, there's nothing that we, uh, arrestable, uh, as far as an accessory. Uh, I think there's a statute of limit. In fact, I know there's a statute of limitation. Right. But, you know, it's just the, you know, uh, I know both the people that, uh, I believe that we're involved, and I'm sure I'll contact them again and just uh, say I did it, I suppose. Uh, but uh, 
I was hoping that, uh, you know, we could clear the case, you know, to maybe see if they have a conscience and maybe they could add to the information. I'm sure yeah. that they had information that would put a, a you know, a lid on all of this that would close the case. Yeah, I was talking to the guys and they said that they did this and this is why. They did tell me some of their evidence they have stored has been sent to crime labs, has been sent to the DOJ lab for testing. Of course, I asked if they could give me any specifics on that. They weren't willing to go there with me. But as you and I both know, Shay, um, DNA technology is the key to solving so many of these cold cases. And um, with this case, it happened several years prior to DNA really being something that that detectives cataloged and made a priority. So therefore, they have a lot of evidence from this case. They have a lot of items from inside cabin 28. They also have the hammer that was found in the pond. So I, I do know they have physical things in the Plumas County Sheriff's Crime Lab that, that they could be testing for. And I guess we'll just have to see what, what comes from that. But um, it's super interesting when it comes to you know, testing a case that's 41 years old. 41 years without an answer. I mean, any crime that goes this long without being solved will stick with the community, but especially one that is this horrific. Madison, what's your sense of what it would mean for the family and for the community to hear some closure in this case, to know that police have figured it out and they know who killed them? For the detectives, it would mean the world. Um, they're, they're, like I said, very close to this case. One of them, uh, Mike Gamberg, he, he teared up when I asked him about his connection to this and how much it means to him to investigate this and to continue to look into, you know, who really did this and why. And um, for the community, it's something you Google Plumas County or Ketty and, and it's the first thing that comes up. That town, that resort has never been the same since. So many people when I was up there asking, oh, we see TV cameras, you know, what's going on? I, I said, Ketty, the moment I said Ketty, everyone was like, oh my goodness, we just, that really has just forever, you know, changed our community and it's just this cloud is over it. And I think for this to be solved, it would lift that cloud, it would um, provide closure, it would give answers to so many families. And it's important to note the Sharp family you know, had the most loss in terms of people who were killed, but the Wingate family too. Dana Wingate was a friend. He was just over that night. He got a ride home with John and then he was murdered. So for the Wingate family, I can't even imagine what this would do. I know Dana's father has been interviewed prior with other journalists and and he said he has no idea why his son was, was murdered in this way. And it just affected so many different families and still has to this day. I think it would just be a monumental case to be solved. And the detectives are working it very hard. I mean, the amount of case files they pulled out to show me how much they have, um, I know it's something that they think about every day. Uh, and somebody out there knows. And uh, and I know that they're there are people that uh, could give me the, the information that uh, would close this case. And uh, I'm open for, uh, for doing that, you know. Uh, Let me ask you both, do you, think, do you think you can close this case? Do you think eventually it will be no longer a cold case? I think we have arrived at a point where um, the scale is tipping in our favor. Beyond Bardstown Unsolved is a production of Vault Studios in partnership with King 5 in Seattle, WHAS 11 in Louisville, and ABC 10 in Sacramento. Make sure you don't miss any future episodes by following or subscribing to the show wherever you're listening right now. And to talk about these cases with other listeners, be sure to join our Facebook group, Unsolved Insiders. Beyond Bardstown Unsolved is hosted by me, Madison Wade, 
and WHAS 11 anchor and investigative journalist, Shay McAllister. Our producer is Reed Redmond. Our executive producers are Will Johnson and Brian Weiss. Thanks also to investigative journalist, Andrea Ash. Audio mixing is done by Richard Humphreys at Tacoma Media in Silver Spring, Maryland.